So welcome to the first bootcamp. Um, today uh, we'll focus on a book called How to Be a Modern Scientist, um, uh, which is not as technical as you would expect, uh, 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 but I think it's gonna uh, help us um, frame our ideas and why we're doing things the way we, we do things. Um, and it's just really gonna be like a, a solid like foundation like for the philosophy that we're, we'll try to follow. Um, so, um, let me get ready to share my screen. Uh -huh. So, Mm -hmm. So I'll send you a link on Slack for the course, for the, where I have things, um, not the course, but I'm, um, okay. And then also the slides that I'll be using today. Sorry, I don't know if I said Slack, I meant Zoom. That's why I'm sending the links. All right, so let's get started. All right. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so this is the first bootcamp. Um, and like we're recording this because either uh, other people at Lever or outside of Lever might be interested in this. And uh, hopefully we'll have you know, new people also join the team in the future. Um, and so really this, um, uh, the idea of today is to uh, uh, go over this book, um, why and like explain why I think it could be useful for all of us. Um, and so uh, I'm building this website uh, called um, biosc underscore team underscore DS and um, my profile on GitHub, uh, which are the links that I sent you on Slack. Um, but in particular, this book is completely available through LeanPub and we'll actually, we'll, we'll spend some time setting this up. Um, um, and it was made by Jeff Leake. Um, okay, so Jeff Leake, or I mean Jeffrey T. Leake, um, wrote this book and it was last updated on April 2016. Um, and and it's um, a very short book, 82 pages, um, you know, depending on the, on, on the length of your pages. Um, and it has around 31,000 readers. Uh, so we will just add to that title a little bit. Um, and so uh, this is a book where Jeff uh, has compiled, compiled uh, ideas that he, he had over years uh, from himself and other people about how to be a scientist the modern uh, open source way, right? Um, and so you've you already uh, know that we make a lot of our code public through GitHub and things like that. Um, and so uh, uh, that's part of the set of tools, but uh, we've never actually explained the framework. So this book will go over that. And so this book is based on blog posts that Jeff wrote on the Simple Statistics blog. Um, this was starting in 2011, still active, uh, but not as much as it used to be. And this is a blog um, with three uh, different faculty members. Uh, Jeff himself, then Roger Peng from, um, from Hopkins by Statistics, and Rafael Rizari, who was at Hopkins and now is at Harvard, uh, and also then at Harvard Cancer, uh, the then at Harvard Cancer Institute. And so uh, this blog became quite popular um, and it's uh, widely accessed. And um, Jeff wanted to organize his ideas that he had over the years into a more concise format and more like coherent. Um, and so that's, that's uh, how this book came to be. Now, um, on this link, linkup.com forward slash modern scientist, you can uh, buy the book. Uh, I'm, I'm putting buy on italics and or like with quotes because um, uh, LeanPub, the way it works, is a, is a, uh, it's a publishing platform that um, uh, 
gives 80% of the royalties back to the authors. And in this case, actually, Jeff chose to um, uh, earn 50% uh, of those royalties himself, and then 50% uh, go to a specific cost. I don't actually remember what is the cost. Um, uh, and uh, Leapup allows authors to set a minimum price, and a suggested price, and a maximum price. And so in this particular case, this book is the suggested price is $10, but you can actually go down to zero and basically get it for free. Um, and so that's why I chose this book and other resources because um, they're, you can either get them for a very accessible price or you can just get them for free. Um, and like Jeff and others uh, really believe that this is the way that, uh, um, like this is a great way to try to reach as many people. Um, um, and so uh, some people might not have any resources at all. Some of them might have more, right? And so, um, um, or like maybe some people just want to try it out and then like if they like it, maybe give some money, right? So, um, so this is really up to you. Um, what I want you to do is to actually um, uh, make a LeanPub account. Um, so access leanpub.com, modern scientist. Um, and then buy the book as, you know, buy for zero dollars right now. Um, and, um, you know, uh, and uh, once you do, let me open that link myself. Um, once you do, you'll notice that um, um, there's many different ways of reading the book. You can read it as a PDF, uh, as a Mobi file, which is the file format used for Amazon Kindle, or you can simply read it on the web. Um, so, like I'm out here on my profile, I'm gonna to go to my library where I can see the books that I've um, purchased over the years. And so when I look here at uh, how to be a modern scientist, and so there's you know there's many different ways here. Um, um, one of them is simply downloading the PDF. So I spent a bit of time on that, um, doing that. Um, and so let me know uh zoom has um if you go under participants you can uh click a yes or a no button um a green or a no button uh so can you let me know whenever you um have access to the book um so now that everyone bought the book right um uh for free potentially um uh, you can then uh, read it uh, in multiple ways. And so uh, there's a LeanPub and Kindle connection, which I spent quite a bit of time uh, uh, learning how to do. Uh, but, um, but maybe maybe you don't want to do this. <laughs> um, and so uh, I'm saying that maybe you don't want to do it because, for example, I read it on my Kindle, highlighted stuff on my Kindle. And then I cannot see my notes on my computer. So that's why I have a little sad face. Um, uh, so you might actually want to just simply just directly download it as a PDF. But if you actually want to do this as a Kindle, um, on your Amazon account, there's something called the Manager Content and Devices um, tab. Um, under that, there's a Preference op, um, section. Um, and then there's another one called Personal Document Settings. And there you have to add to your approved personal document email list the hello at leanpub.com email address. Um, and so like this link over here at leanpub has all those instructions. Uh, but actually, some of this stuff didn't actually work for me. So I, what I ended up doing is that you can actually download from leanpub what's called the MOBI file, M-O-B-I. And then you can email it manually to your, um, to your uh, Kindle address. Um, so this book, like you can definitely read it on a Kindle. Uh, uh, you don't need to read it on your computer, uh, but you might want to simply read it as a PDF. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to assume that most of you are just going to either read it on the website or, or on a PDF for now. Um, so the table of contents, there's quite a bit here, right? Uh, I mean, 
there's an introduction and about the author. But in between of that, there's like around 10 or so chapters. Um, um, uh, paper writing, publishing, peer review, data sharing, scientific blogging, scientific code, social media and science, teaching in science, books, internal scientific communication, scientific talks, reading scientific papers, credit, career planning, and your online identity. Um, so that's quite a bit of, you know, um, of things to care about um, uh, or um, to read more on. And so, um, uh, in the website I am building, like I wrote a little like overview about it, about this book. Um, and that's basically what I'm mentioning in, in slide format right now. Um, but I also want you to, uh, to think about how many chapters, like, like I mean, you exclude the introduction and the table of contents and the about the author sections. How many chapters do you think currently apply to you? Um, and that might be different from the next question, which is like, how many of them are you, are you interested in, right? Um, so, uh, so let me uh, pause the recording so you can think a bit more about this. Um, I thought I had learned the, the keyboard shortcuts with the zooming and pausing, but maybe it didn't. Um, okay, um, so. Um, so we just discussed uh, what uh, some of you are interested in, um, uh, and uh, and I, the, you could almost like rotating ninety degrees, and I feel like these are like toggles, right? And so everyone has a different profile, right? Some of us try to maximize some of these points. Some of us are just like, I want to know a little bit about it, and sometimes. There might be things that we're like, ah, I don't really care about this, right? And so we're all a bit different, but I do agree that like um, that a lot of these topics actually apply to us. And and something that's actually quite important or useful from this book is that um, it gives us a framework to think about each of these different important topics. Um, um, and so this can be like a launching pad. So like, let's say you want to make a Twitter uh, account um, and, um, and tweet about science. There are uh, some important thoughts on this chapter that, like, um, that are very useful to know um, before maybe you start actually making your, uh, before you decide to make a social account uh, for science. Um, or like um, techniques about reading papers and stuff. And so, um, so why this book? Um, the target audience of this book, uh, when Jeff wrote it, uh, he had a academ academics in mind. So graduate students, postdocs, and like PIs, right? And so um, uh, most of you are actually not graduate students or postdocs right now. And like, I mean, people will be seeing this video in the future, they might be. But, um, but um, overall, like where we work, the uh, Institute for Brain Development is an industry academia hybrid. So. Uh, so we should actually be reading some papers and software, right? Um, so, and um, that's something that um, I personally need to do a better job of reading uh, about what's going on in the world. Um, but as an institute and like as a team, we're definitely involved in publishing papers, presenting results, sharing data, sharing code, and many of the other uh, chapter titles that we just saw. Uh, so individually, maybe maybe some people do more code and, and, and generate more data than actually publish, than write papers or present results. Um, although everyone has the option to do that, right? Um, um, and another thing of, of why this book is we actually do work with a lot of the target audience uh, for the book, right? We do work uh, quite a bit with like um, uh, academics, and so. Um, um, as part of, of what we'll be doing on the data science guidance sessions, we'll actually uh, guide like students and postdocs, right? And so, um, uh, so knowing what they're going to go through or what things that could be useful for them is also useful for us, right? As guides in that sense. Um, and so basically this is the same theme that I've been saying for, um, that has motivated all, all the boot camps, which is like having a common 
referral source referral source will be useful. Um, and then like also why this book? Well, Jeff was my PhD advisor, and I've been learning about this way of life for a while, uh, this way of thinking. Um, and actually, some of the things he says he shouldn't do is probably because I made them. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, um, um, uh, like uh, I've definitely made mistakes along the way, right? and, uh, and um, Jeff is very thoughtful about his advice and uh, um, definitely less confrontational than sometimes um, um, other people are. And so that you know, that is a very uh, that's a very good way of of leading um, uh, li uh, of living your academic life or your scientific life. Um, um, so I like a lot of how Jeff thinks. Um, um, now, um, also like talking with you guys right now, I like uh, the uh, like the book and knowing all the different you know, uh, sections of the book um, can be useful because um, uh, sometimes there's a concept that you're interested in learning, but you don't actually have a name for the concept. Right, and so uh, here we actually get like specific bullets, right, for each of the um, um, different components of being a scientist that we might care about, right? And so uh, the bootcamp won't be long enough for this, but definitely like the next, you know, we have a lot of time together, such that like um, I can teach you about these things if there's a particular subject that you want to learn more on beyond what's on the book, right? Um, and then, uh, like, if we go back to this image of like the toggles, right? So if you want to learn more about something, um, I can uh, guide you in that area more. Okay, so that's on the book. Um, so let's look at the introduction. So. Um, each of these chapters, Jeff tries to answer three different questions for each of the chapters. One of them is, uh, what, what should I do and why should I be doing this, right? So why should I be reading papers? Um, um, then the next bullet he tries to answer the next question is, what tools should I use, right? And so Jeff tries to use like open source tools or I mean, or free to access tools most of the time. Um, uh, some of them do require subscriptions, some of the ones he, he suggests them. Um, and then uh, for each chapter, he might have like uh, more advanced tips or, or like concerns about how to take it from there. Now note that this book was last updated in 2016. So we might be using newer tools than the ones listed on the book. Or um, maybe it's because I like other software than Jeff, right? Um, um, so that's the framework of this book. Um, and in the overview that I presented, I actually, like parts of the website that I'm building um, are based on these chapters uh, or expand my thoughts on the chapters. So for example, there's a chapter on career planning. And so that gave, uh, there's a chapter on the uh, how to be a modern scientist book on career planning and that led to the career growth chapter on, on the website that I'm uh, working on right um, and so the career planning chapter by Jeff is uh, is longer and was mo in more detail um, and, in, and it mentions for example a list of questions adapted from Ben Langmead um, and I'm I distilled that information and made it shorter for, for you guys. And so and between this week and uh, the beginning of next week, I'll be meeting with all of you to have some career planning sessions. Um, all the people in the team. Um, 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 there's, a, a, there's two chapters on scientific reading, like writing and then presentations. And so we'll actually apply this in the weekly meetings that we'll have on the section on papers and software. Um, so these will provide us uh, a training ground on how to, um, 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 uh, for us to practice these concepts on the book. Um, um, and it's gonna evolve over time. Right? 
Um, so let me uh, pause. Mm, maybe I'll pause. All right. So um, uh, what I'll do now is uh, I'll dive a bit into the book. Uh, this is a PDF version that I have, and I read it on my, my Kindle, so I don't have my notes highlighted here, which is what I wanted to show you. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll, the idea of what I'm going to try to do in the next uh, minutes is to just give you an overview of what this book has. Um, um, so, uh, uh, paper writing here, this is a chapter I would actually recommend maybe later reading later on uh, because it's like oh you should like share your code you should like um, uh, have nice figures and stuff and this is like some of that stuff is explained in the, in the latter chapters um, uh, but one of them is if you're writing a book uh, sorry a paper the main thing is to make the figures the focus of what you're writing and so um, uh, uh, at some point, he's like, hmm, how do you actually write? Uh, so, um, okay. Um, yeah, I'll get back to that, sorry. Um, so, I actually like this description from Jeff quite a bit about like what is an academic paper. Um, so it is like either you have some methods that you're describing, some data that you're showing, uh, some results or some claims that you want to advance. Um, and so uh, the claims, that's the hardest part, right? And like potentially this is something that like I or like our biological collaborators might spend more time on um, um, or, the, or the, let's say the, the graduate student or the postdoc leading some of the papers or whoever's writing, whoever has to spend a lot of time thinking about what, what the results will mean, right? He's probably gonna write that section. Um, uh, and um, all of us will at least like write some of the methods or describe some of the data results, right? Um, uh, in different projects. Um, so those are the four like main components of a paper. Um, uh, and so, uh, uh, so one question that Jeff explores is when do you start writing a paper? Um, and, um, and one of them, this is like tr really tricky because it's, this is when uh, you have enough information, um, then it's like at that point and that's, uh, in a, a perfect time to start writing a paper um, or a great time to start writing a paper. And there's this thing about the perfect is the enemy of the very good or the good. Um, and that happens a lot to us. Um, uh, sometimes you want to just have the best paper out there, um, but it might take you a very long time to write that paper. Um, and then like you might realize that like there's no perfect solution or no perfect paper. Um, all right. um, so Jeff explores the question of how do you actually start writing? And so this is where we come back to the figures. And, um, and this is actually something we do quite a bit, which is you first want to have the, the figures that you're going to show. So you want to have like one or four, one to four quality plots. And each of those plots actually might have uh, multiple subplots. So like in a lot of the projects we're working on, we're working actually on, on the figures first. So you, you might not actually be seeing a paper in your mind, but like, um, but like we're already thinking of like, what are the figures we wanna show? For example, we might not have like a supplementary figure about how, um, how some of the samples we selected were chosen, right? Um, and so actually some of you in, in, you're in a phase of a project where you're doing that, right? And so um, uh, the way I'm viewing it though is like, okay, we have, a, we have our, our figure that's gonna show 
that particular step of the process, right? So now let's show, the, uh, like, let's get the next step of our of our story out there, and um, and that is really uh, figure focused, um, and that's that's going to be directly related to our reading the reading scientific papers chapter. Um, uh, then there's more details about like what is actually involved in a paper. Um, and there's a lot of pieces here, like the title, labs, and introduction methods, analysis, and stuff like that. Um, and um, a paper is quite a bit of work, right? And so some of the la latter chapters are directly involved with like specific parts of it. For example, like uh, data sharing is actually part of the methods where you describe where it is the data, right? And, um, um, and so we'll get to that part. Um, then there's other sections here that are like maybe less uh, of, of less interest to uh, right now, which is the publishing chapter. Um, and why is that? That's because we already have a defined system of how we do stuff, right? Um, and uh, we like, we like to uh, post preprints, um, and that is a great way of, of advancing science. You know, it is also, um, there's also very good reasons why you should post preprints, uh, because it helps uh, junior members in the team, right, uh, get some of that credit at an earlier phase, and that can enable them to advance their careers faster. Um, um, but a lot of this publishing chapter is about convincing people to post preprints, why it's useful for you. Uh, also highlight maybe potentially some of the drawbacks about it. Um, so this publishing chapter, um, uh, uh, like, uh, is good if you're curious about like what is the philosophy of how we chose to do things. Uh, 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 but it's not something we're actually gonna change much, right? Um, our, um, because we're already posting preprints and stuff like that. Uh, peer review. So um, this is also one of the chapters that applies less to you guys right now, because uh, this is when people ask you to to, to check uh, someone else's papers. Uh, now it, it, in, it will apply to us in the sense that uh, we will send our manuscripts, our papers to be reviewed by others. And they'll respond to us, right, uh, about what they thought about our work. Um, and uh, and then we, we will need to respond to the criticism. Um, and so, uh, let me see. Uh, there's a phrase here that I like, I'm trying to find. Um, 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 okay. uh, I don't have it highlighted here. Anyway, um, but like the phrase that, uh, uh, or the statement that I want to highlight from Jeff is like, whenever you get uh, comments from others, um, uh, you might be tempted to respond to their criticism um, and to argue why uh, their criticism is incorrect or doesn't apply to the current case. Um, and that is a trap because you might feel too tempted to respond in a personal way. Um, and uh, instead, uh, um, Maybe it's on the peer review here. Um, instead, you should try to uh, try to be calm. Try not to um, try not to engage in a direct uh, discussion with a reviewer. Um, because if you try to make it personal, you're actually going to lose that that argument. Um, um, and so you need a lot of patience um, for that. Okay, right. peer review. So I, I forgot where that was. Okay. Let's look into data sharing. So um, data sharing is something we do, but we could actually do better, right? And so um, Jeff here argues that the question of reproducibility isn't if anymore, it's how, right? And so um, 
uh, people have been advocating for a while that you actually need to share data if you want your analysis to be reproduced. Um, uh, the problem is we don't have actually like very, uh, as a field, we don't have um, very well defined standards of how to share the data. Right? Um, um, and so there's a lot of uh, room open for to interpretation, right? Um, um, and we're trying to do a good job, but we potentially could be doing a better job. And so the data, you have to make it public. So you can post it on a public repository. But the thing that we're not doing a great job sometimes is organizing and documenting our data. Um, and so this involves actually two things. You, we should post the raw data. So this is the data that has, a, like for example, the data that we get from um, the sequencing team at Liber, uh, led by Johan. Um, like all the FASCI files, let's say, for our RNAC project. But we should also be sharing the tidy versions of our data. And so these are, the, for example, the clean um, ray summarized experiment objects that, let's say, someone like Luis or Josh uh, created, right? Um, um, so this is something we do do. We do share the raw data and the tidy versions of our data. Um, However, something that we don't always do a great job of is explaining exactly um, all the steps in that data. Um, uh, so all, all the covariates that we have, what they actually mean, because we work with complicated covariates, right? Um, and so sometimes here, what is really good is to make um, a code book explaining every, every single uh, variable that uh, that is, for example, in the cold data slot of our ray summarized experiment object. Um, but is this something that we haven't done a great job of? And why is that? This is because, like, um, a lot of times in the process of a project, this is relegated towards the end. And at the end, like, you just want to get done. You just want to be done with the project. Um, and uh, it's actually sometimes better to do it earlier on because you might that information might be useful for new team members that join to um uh that join the project and is going to going to be helping analyze that data um and we also post all the relevant code however sometimes our code is a little bit messy and it's not as well organized so um so there's a lot of stuff here that we need to sometimes improve um, so let's see. Um, right. uh, well, <laughs> there's this whole section on, on the book based on an editorial posted on, on the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which was about data sharing. And the editor there used the term research parasite um, as a negative term. Um, and uh, uh, Jeff explains a lot about why this was not a good uh, editorial um, um, and he, what his concerns are with it. But uh, um, I just wanted to mention it because there's actually the Research Parasite Awards that were uh, created uh, because of that uh, editorial. Um, um, and uh, uh, Rafael Yuzari actually won it at some, in, uh, in 2019. He won that award. Um, um, and these are people in our field that were like, oh, uh, you think a research parasite is a bad thing? Actually, that's a great thing. Those are the people that are making it easier for, um, they're reusing data in, the, in that other people have published um, and um, and without them, like science wouldn't be advancing as much. So that's the research parasite, and there's also the research symbiont, which uh, um, I'm a part of their committee. Um, uh, uh, and that's because I got one of the awards also in 2019. So. Um, so if you, heard, if you hear about those terms, research simian or research parasite, uh, reading that chapter of Jeff's book will be quite useful to understanding what, uh, what, everything, uh, what are all the issues with it. Okay, 
Um, so that um, so data sharing is something that we need to do a better job of organizing our code and all of that and our data. And so there's actually a chapter in scientific code and that will explain more of that in a bit. Scientific blogging. So as far as I know, none of you have a blog post, right, or a blog website. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Um, well, I do. <laughs> I love scientific blogging. Um, I don't actually spend as much time on it as I did maybe in the past. Um, but Jeff has multiple reasons to mention scientific blogging. Um, um, and so, he says like there are many reasons why you want to do it. One of them is to respond to criticism. That's actually not a reason why I blog at all. Um, 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 I rarely respond to, uh, well, I, I guess I haven't gotten a lot of criticism in the past, but I haven't used this version of a blog most um, uh, in the past mostly. Uh, maybe a little bit here or there. Um, another one is for raising your profile. And so this is a big reason why I like to blog. Um, 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 and so a, on a blog, you have control of how you want to explain things. And um, you, it allows you, for example, to, to explain the results of a paper in a less um, technical uh, way. And that could be quite useful. You want to explain the results of your work for a broader audience. Um, um, I like writing blogs also because it, uh, blog posts um, um, as a reminder to myself of how I solved a specific problem. Um, and um, I'm not a native English speaker, so writing uh, blog posts helps me practice writing in English and explaining my ideas and thoughts to others. And so that's, um, those are reasons why I like to, to, to blog. Um, um, but like for you guys and everyone, like um, Jeff here highlights some other points of why it can be important. So maybe you want to practice your storytelling or your communication skills. Um, or maybe you have some great data visualizations that you want to share uh, or teach people how to do something. Um, uh, or discuss something that is important to the industry. And so all those reasons are uh, um, one great, I mean, one great motivation for practicing all of this is that all these skills are like highly valued in our field, right? And so if you're a great storyteller or communicator, uh, there's a lot of great jobs in data science that uh, rely on having good um, uh, communication skills. Um, um, you had like a great data visualization skills. That's also really good because like that's basically what we do, right? We make plots, right? Um, um, if you're great at teaching, that's also uh, gonna be of interest to others uh, that want to hire data scientists that can explain all the complicated concepts to the rest of their teams. Right uh, to the rest of their um, scientific teams, and so this is like translating knowledge, right? Um, uh, um, and so these three bullets, right? Like it's important to practice them. And so, as um, a couple of years ago, I created a blog that all of you will are welcome to contribute to, which is a, a LIBD R Stats Club uh, website. Um, and so you don't actually have to spend as much time dealing with the technology and how to set up that blog. Um, uh, but I just want to invite all of you to, if you have ideas, um, or if you simply want to practice your skills in these areas, right? Um, and that's a great, uh, uh, venue. And so we'll, uh, on the website that I'm building, um, uh, there's a section on how to contribute. And so that's where I'll explain how to contribute to the LIB, the RSS Club website. Um, and so uh, other people in the past, in Andrew's team have actually written blog posts um, 
and uh, for example, um, a former um, master's student, Amy Peterson, wrote a blog post and like that, having that blog and other things helped her to secure a job as a data scientist in New York, right? And so this will be part of the career advancement. Um, and, um, and so scientific blogging, scientific communication is um, uh, a great way to get your name out there. Um, and so we don't wanna actually talk about the tools because um, the tools that I like to use are different from all of the ones that Jeff mentioned for writing blog posts. Um, and then he gets more into details about like um, dealing with criticism. Uh, and if, if someone criticizes a paper of yours and you want to respond on a blog post, but that's, that actually doesn't really apply to us. And, um, we haven't, we don't have you know, experiences like that, like he had. Okay, um, scientific code. So um, we already write code, right? And we have been teaching all of you to use GitHub to share your code through a public repository. Um, um, so this is something you know I highly value. Um, uh, and some of the things that we are working on are on organizing and documenting our code. Right? So for example, for the organizing section, we've been learning about the recent tool called the HERE package, right? Um, and how that can help us to organize our code. Um, 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 then uh, we're gonna learn about building software too, so building our packages. Um, and that's gonna be helpful for sharing more of our code and maybe also uh, even getting uh, our code to a higher level of standard such that it can be admitted onto like a website like PyConductor, for example. Um, um, so GitHub is central for everything we do with code. Um, um, and by conductor, uh, uh, because we work with a lot of genomic software, is also central to us. But uh, some of you, like let's say Maddie, who's working more in imaging analysis, might be more interested in like CRAN, R open sci, or something that's called um, Neuroconductor. Um, um, that's made by one of our friends. Um, um, all right, so we'll be sharing code, we'll be showing uh, scripts. Um, um, and we might also be sharing something that's called literal, literate programming. And so that name might be unknown to you. The name that is more commonly known for you guys is our markdown, right? So this is Huang or Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so these are files that contain both text and the code output. Uh, they take longer to make uh, than a regular R scripts or, um, or um, um, yeah, than regular R scripts, but they have a lot of advantages um, um, and they guarantee a higher level of, uh, of, uh, of reproducibility than a simple R script. Um, however, sometimes we don't have all the, all the time to make our markdowns, right? Uh, because they're, um, you, need, you need to fully test them before you can compile them. Um, and so for some projects, we, we, are, we actually do, uh, to rely on leader programming. So for example, on the new Speakeasy project, several of you have worked on, on literal, literate documents um, as a way of sharing our code. Now, this is a great quote from uh, Carl Broman, who's a um, faculty at um, University of Wisconsin. And like one of the great reasons of why we want to document our code is because the, your closest collaborator is you six months ago, but you don't respond to the emails anymore. <laughs> so that's a great quote. <laughs> and that will happen to us. And so uh, some of you have already been experiencing experienced this. Um, like, uh, where you're like, oh, like you look at code from a couple of months ago, you're like, ah, I don't like, I don't remember what I was thinking here, right? And um, that's why like uh, we use also GitHub and, uh, and why I uh, highly recommend everyone to use um, verbose git commit messages, right? So just that so we can remember what we were thinking a couple of weeks or months ago. Um, 
and like I mean the session information is always useful uh, we always include that um, all right uh, once we start building code we need to document it uh, but this is something that I'll um, I'll skip a bit because this is something we'll uh, address more on the building tidy tools uh, workshop um, how, how we can document things um, uh, like help files and also vignettes and things like that. Um, cool. Let me move on to social media and science. Um, so social media and science here, uh, um, first Jeff asks, like, why should you do it? And, uh, and um, why is it relevant? Um, and so one reason is you want to promote work of other people, right? So um, uh, this is actually like a, uh, um, a reason I would love if you had uh, Twitter accounts uh, because then I can also promote you guys. But uh, I also, I mean, I understand that there's a strong reasons why sometimes people don't want to make a social media account in science. But let's say you have an account. Um, this makes it easier for me to highlight all of you um, and to give, uh, you, you know, um, uh, to make it easier for other people to find you, right? And, um, and you know, potentially get in touch with you and uh, maybe, you know, make you job offers or things like that, right, in the future. Um, that's one way. Um, uh, Let's say you're reading papers, right? Or you are interested in software. Um, a social media account can, uh, for science can also be a great way to find that those um, papers, software, or people um, that are people you might be interested in connecting with. Uh, or, um, or that simply share um, the papers they thought were interested in. And so uh, uh, that's actually related to Know, using the social media account to promote the work of other people because those people are being content creators and so maybe you just want to follow like good content creators uh, they also might be funny and so um, uh, or you might think that they're interesting um, um, so uh, having a social media account is a great way to follow those people um, and uh, there's a lot of people that have a social media account without any tweets at all, like a Twitter account without any tweets at all, but they're just following people, right? They're just uh, feeding on the content other people share, right? Um, I do this a lot, which is the sharing the work that you do, right? And so this is also where like, uh, if there's people in the team that have Twitter accounts and I can directly highlight them on Twitter, right? Um, um, Jeff goes into, into a bit of Twitter versus Facebook and their uses. Um, for us, it's really just Twitter. In Mexico, people use Facebook a lot for science, um, but that's, I don't think, as much the case here. Um, and um, uh, there's more tips here that Jeff gives. For example, you might not need to develop your own content, right? Um, you can always be sharing content from others. These people that are, have become really good at sharing people content from others, and one of them in particular, her name is Mar Mara Averick. Um, her Twitter account is Data and Me. Um, and she got hired by our studio because she got she got really good at sharing content made by others, and so she does a lot of. Let me see if I can find a tweet. Um, 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 she does tweets like this, for example, that where she takes a couple of screenshots from people, from stuff they've done. Um, uh, uh, right, like, uh, the, like, again, figures tell a story, right? So she highlights some of those uh, things that she found interested in. Uh, she edits of those figures um, and adds a source handle here on the bottom right, um, um, uh, which you know takes a little bit of time, 
Um, and then she highlights the Twitter accounts of the people that were involved. So this type of tweet um, uh, gets a lot of uh, other people engaged and stuff, right? And so she's a great uh, content creator that you might want to follow, for example, uh, on the R world. Um, and, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, we all start from somewhere, right? Um, and uh, uh, there's many different ways of, that you can use social media to your advantage. Um, another one is that you might be, uh, you might want to make all online friends and then meet them offline. And so there's a particular uh, Hopkins faculty person, uh, Hopkins faculty member, uh, Stefan Hicks, that some of you already have heard about or even worked with. And she and I, we actually uh, became online friends before we met at a conference in 2014. Uh, um, and that's just one example uh, for me, but like I've, I've done this with like multiple people. Uh, and so um, the examples that Jeff provides here are like related to students and things like that. But let, let's say that, uh, uh, let's say you're a staff member at Lieber uh, and you might want to get, you know, maybe you want to meet staff members at, let's say, um, um, Mount Sinai in New York, right? Um, and they might have similar career concerns to the ones you have, and they could become great people to get to know, to, uh, to bounce ideas off, um, and to learn also from their experiences and how they've, let, let's say, they are... Um, uh, navigating their careers, right? And so, um, uh, I've uh, benefited a lot from uh, meeting people, making friends, and uh, um, getting advice from them over the years. So, uh, that's a great uh, motivation for me. Um, um, and, uh, you know, it might be for you too. Um, oh yeah. There's one aspect, though, about social media is that People can uh, be very positive or very negative in social media. So, um, so if you're posting about like uh, issues that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, for example, racist, feminism, economic inequality, uh, there's going to be a lot of um, um, uh, people that think on the extremes. And if you, you know, maybe you want to be, or maybe you don't want to be the center of a lot of attention, right? So. Um, uh, uh, I don't post personally as much about those type, those type of topics. Um, other people do, um, um, but then, um, like for example, I've posted about like stuff about Mexico and the U.S. here, there, and then you get like troll responses, right? Um, people like tell, in my case because I'm from Mexico, tell, people telling me like, oh, go back to the country you're from, things like that, right? So, um, so that's you know you have to think about what you're what you what is the type of attention you want to get um, and if you're mostly interested in in the in other scientists maybe just uh, uh, focus on that section or other R programmers let's say um, um, but yeah social media can be um, um, can you know uh, you can meet nasty people that way or nasty computer bots um, Teaching science, so um, we will be doing this um, and we'll be putting materials online for the people to access. We'll be putting videos online too. Um, uh, um, and that's part of uh, why like, we'll be recording our uh, journal club presentations. Not the discussions, but the presentations themselves. Um, um, and um, um, we could even like write blog posts about like some of our uh, data science guidance sessions. Um, if you're interested in scientific blogging for some of the reasons we mentioned before. Um, um, and so like, I like being quite open. Um, there's more um, things you could do like building a massive online open course website. Uh, that takes a lot of effort. And so we potentially won't be doing any of that. Books, uh, we, 
I don't think any of us will be writing any books soon, um, uh, except like some of the documentation and stuff that we use internally. Um, and so that leads to the internal scientific communication chapter. Um, um, and so we use Slack a lot and, um, uh, uh, and GitHub and other tools. Um, uh, and so I don't think I need to explain too much about this chapter because we're already doing quite a bit of things here. Um, and something that is directly related to the chapter is the website that I'm building. Um, uh, because um, the idea of this website is that it's going to be a better, more complete version of the onboarding website that we, were, that we had in the past. Um, and it's also going to explain to, you know, to all of us how like we do some things, right? Or, um, and it takes time, right, to build this website. So that's why we haven't we hadn't done it in the past. Um, but it hopefully will make it easier for new team members to join and get to up to speed on what are the things we like to do. Um, and that's because um, uh, uh, um, whenever we bring in someone, right, like we're going to try to uh, offload a lot of our knowledge onto them. Uh, and that can you know, be um, very challenging because uh, we, uh, there's a lot of acronyms, a lot of things we've learned over the years, right? Um, or even over the last couple of months. And, um, and I mean, Luis and Arthur, who are newest members, have gone through some of this uh, transition period, right? Of just learning what are the things we're talking about. Um, scientific talks. So uh, uh, we'll practice some of this. Uh, on our uh, journal club presentations. Um, but uh, there's many different types of scientific talks. And actually a very, uh, very interesting point here is that sometimes you should make the, your talks to entertain, not to teach. Um, and why is that? Like depending on the venue of where you're presented, your goals might just be to meet people, to make people excited about your, uh, your ideas and results. Uh, to make sure people understand your ideas or results. And then um, sometimes you just want to practice speaking, right? Um, and so we'll be doing um, some of this, uh, um, but the entertainment portion is uh, really interesting, like that point of view, why uh, Jeff argues that like it's maybe good to entertain. Um, um, and so that applies more to for a conference, um, but it could also be um, uh, part of a journal club uh, to some extent, right? You still want to explain about the ideas, um, uh, things like that, but um, uh, uh, if the goal is to make people excited about a paper, maybe you also want to just entertain them about the paper or software. Um, instead of explaining every detail about the paper. Um, so this is, a, this is a interesting point of view um, uh, about how to do things a little bit differently. Um, so um, on a group meeting, right, maybe the goal of your meeting is to update people on what you were doing and to get help. Um, and uh, we might also have presentations like this, right, because we're gonna have space devoted for people for um, for people to ask questions that they need help with, um, and so this is something that uh, the ideal presentation should include, which is a small introduction to the problem, uh, some updates of what you've tried, but then also have a lot of space for discussion about what you're trying to do next, right, or where you need help, um, and this is this short introduction to the problem gets really complicated, right? Because um, sometimes you want to explain every single thing you've done, and then it does, it, lo it, 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 not, it no longer becomes a short introduction, it becomes a very long introduction, right? Um, and so we've all done this in the past, um, and uh, this is something that we need to think of uh, the next time we're asking for help. How can we make, uh, how can we entertain others? 
right? So that we can get help from them. Uh, so what is the minimal information they need? Um, 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 so um, there's a lot more in this chapter about scientific thoughts uh, that I'll let you guys explore uh, more in detail. We're near the end. So reading scientific papers, um, there's many reasons uh, why you might be interested and there's different types of journals. Um, sorry, many different reasons why you might be interested in reading papers and also many different types of journals. So Jeff here highlights some of the broad categories of scientific journals. Um, 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 uh, uh, and then how can you, how, what are the tools you can use to try to find them? Now, here I would say that this section about like, what are the papers you want to read and journals and all of that will really depend on what is what are the things you're interested in in learning more right and so this i think is if you decide to make the social media account i think here the question becomes more like who are the creators you want to follow right um, because maybe you identify creators that uh, that are already identifying the knowledge that, you know that you're interested in and uh, let's say we found let's say we found that tweet from Mar Mara Averick, right? And we're like, oh, that's a great thing. Like, that looks really like something I want to learn more about. Uh, Mara will typically include a link here, right? And so this link in this particular case leads to a, a website about a, a, a contest on, uh, and uh, it's going to take a bit of time to read all of this, right? Um, um, and so, uh, at this point is in a way the equivalent of reading a scientific paper, but you're reading like, an, 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 like a, a more technical description of, of an event of interest in this case. Um, um, so yeah, creators for your uh, uh, social media science, I think uh, actually um, overwrite a lot of this stuff about the different types of journals and things like that. Um, I used to have, email notifications from journals like Nature and Science and other journals about with specific keywords of topics I was interested in. But nowadays I mostly just look on Twitter and see like what are, you know, things that people are commenting on. And if I, uh, and the people I follow on Twitter are people that um, uh, have overlapping interests, in, interests with mine, right? And so if I have multiple people that I follow on Twitter mentioning a particular paper, then that makes that makes it easier for me to identify a particular paper or scientific event uh, or um, uh, or software that I want to learn more about. So, um, so I think this section has evolved quite a bit uh, about how do you identify papers to read. Now, how do you actually read them? So this is. Uh, um, Oh, also about tools for getting the papers. We don't need any of this stuff because we have access to most papers through Hopkins. Um, and I can show you some of the, uh, there's a little piece of JavaScript code for your browser that will make it easier for that. Now, let's say you find a paper. So how much do you read? That's a great question, right? And so for me, like a lot of times it's that I'm starting from Twitter, right? And so Jeff has his breakdown here of like, 100% of the time he reads the title of a paper. Like 20 to 50% of the time he reads the abstract. Five to 10% of the time he looks at the figures captions. And like one to 3% he reads the whole paper, right? Um, and so uh, I, don't, I, mean, I don't have any data on my own personal tendencies, but for me it's like 100% of the times I read the tweet. Not the, I mean, not the title, I read the tweet. Uh, um, and then uh, sometimes I do look at the abstract uh, of the paper, and then um, and then uh, a lesser percent of that of the times, and then actually download the paper, um, and then at that point I'll look at the figures. Um, and why do we actually look at figures? Because figures are actually like uh, how people uh, uh, highlight the, their stories. Um, and so actually, 
a lot of times I might just look at a, a specific figure of the paper, right? Um, and then from that figure of the paper, I'll try to find the methods and results related to that particular figure of the paper. And that might be all of all the things that I read. Um, um, uh, and uh, a very small percent of the papers, I actually read the whole paper, just like Jeff. Um, and so this is a, if you know how people behave when they read papers, then this is also going to alter how you write papers. Because you're going to try to make sure that um, everything on the figure is clear. Um, and if people want to learn more, then they can go to the methods or the results. Um, it's not how they're formatted. It's not how papers are formatted. It's not how they're presented to people. But that's how actually people read them most of the times. Um, 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 and so there's more details here about how to read those sections, how to interpret, uh, how do you deal with the paper, um, and how do you deal with hype. Hype is such a big uh, um, thing in our field, um, uh, and that's because people are always pressured to say that they've done something great, that they've had a breakthrough. Um, uh, uh, because they're like, oh, or that they're close to having a breakthrough because they're just um, going to use the paper as a way to secure more funding, right? Um, and so this gets tricky. Um, 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 and I think I, like really uh, the only solution for this is to have more experience, right? To read more papers in order to have a better, better, um, uh, way of valuing uh, whether what someone is writing is too much hype or is it or does it seem like it's uh, grounded in reality um, and so something that is actually very important with reading papers is to explain them to someone else because that's how you can make sure that you're understanding uh, the, the core concepts of a paper and those that's also why we're gonna have a journal club um, uh, this section about find found if find if others have read it that's that's basically where I start from Twitter. Um, a different way of checking it though is from the actually bio archive itself or website websites like that. So let's look at, for example, at a, a one of my preprints. If I look on bio archive um, on their uh, metrics, bio archive actually links to tweets people have uh, mentioned about this particular paper. And so, well, here, I mean, these are some tweets that I wrote um, that got retweeted and things like that. But I can actually, like, um, here, for example, right, there was, oh, I clicked on her profile. Um, um, here we can find a tweet about someone mentioning this, uh, the paper and what they thought about it, right? Um, and so, Sometimes you can learn a lot about uh, from what people are tweeting about your papers or other people's papers and stuff like that. So you, uh, they might share whether they think this is a good paper or not a good paper, right? And so based on your opinion of that person, you can also try to, um, that person and other people you know, then you can start to build also your opinion too, right? We'll get a little bit of, of a feel of what everyone else thinks about the paper. Um, uh, credit, uh, um, again, this gets a bit complicated and like, and like some of you might not be as interested in credit as others, right? Um, but one of the things you can start to do is actually to quantify everything, quantify everything you do. So that leads, for example, to how many stars you have on a GitHub repository how many downloads you have for a particular package you've made um, and things like that. Uh, but this is a lot more focused on, um, on a PI career, for example. Um, um, uh, so some of you might be interested, some of you might not be as interested in that chapter. Career planning, I'm going to skip because that's the chapter that uh, I've explained a bit already last week. Um, and. Um, and that I ask you to, to read more carefully uh, before we meet um, for 
for our career uh, uh, planning sessions. So that leads us to the last chapter, which is about your online identity. And so this is something I've struggled a lot with Jeff's advice, because he, for example, says, have a standard handle, right? And so I had my own standard handle for a very long time, even before I was uh, a PhD student. Um, the problem is what the, my standard handle was not really related to my name. Uh, for example, Jeff uses JT Lee as his standard handle. Um, and uh, my standard handle was uh, Felgernon, uh, which is a random name. Um, uh, and uh, so I have a lot of mixed feelings about this. Um, uh, 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 I do agree that you need a standard handle. But whether your standard handle has to be something that is your name or not, well, that depends. Um, and there's people that are really, really very famous. I was just mentioning, for example, Mara. Mara has her her handle is Data and Me, which is not um, her name, and she has like forty five thousand followers. Right. Um, um, uh, but a lot of people like to use. Uh, initials that are related to their names and last names. Um, so I actually just changed mine to make it more consistent, to make it consistent between Twitter and GitHub and Gmail. Um, um, uh, because uh, I, I guess I've been slowly transitioning away from Telegram into my, uh, my GitHub uh, username. Um, um, Something that is really, really important is this one about don't be a jerk. Uh, um, and so if you're using online, anything online, people on the internet will see it, right? Um, uh, he, met, he even mentions your mom, for example, being able to see what you do online. I don't think my mom has seen it <laughs> I don't like, but, but, um, um, but, uh, um, this has actually helped me a lot. So um, I, in the past, I would sometimes complain online um, and, um, and I received the advice to try to do that less. Um, and I think that has helped me because uh, um, I mostly try to share the, the positive things or like um, or the things that excite me or, or news developments. Um, um, and so I try to be constructive. And so Jeff actually mentions this also here in the next phrase, right? You want to be, have constructive contributions. Um, and so uh, I've been told now by people that like they like like what I what they see of me on Twitter, for example. They like how I try to give credit to other, to everyone else that was involved or people that I'm getting resources from. Um, and so. Um, um, the hard part is whenever someone else is a jerk to you, right? <laughs> uh, that's when you maybe be tempted to respond in a similar kind of way, but um, it's best to avoid responding. And so even though uh, Jeff has a whole this, uh, section on his book about uh, using blogs to respond to criticism, some of those thoughts apply also, for example, to social media and things like that. Um, how do you how do you deal with uh, with negative uh, feedback? Um, um, cool. So um, I think by now, like I mean, you have a pretty good idea of what is um, uh, covered in this book. Um, um, and I'm gonna stop recording.